Today we're going to be talking a bit more about electromagnetic waves, this time about how we detect them. So we can see over here a picture of a human eye, which is probably the most familiar way to detect electromagnetic waves. Except of course it can only detect them if they're in the visible light part of the spectrum. In the rest of the slide we're going to look at ways of detecting invisible pieces of electromagnetic radiation. Let's start off with the lowest energy type. Radio waves are of course the least energetic type of electromagnetic wave. We usually use them for communication, that's why we have radios. So they're produced by collecting an electrical circuit called an oscillator to an aerial. So the electrical circuit, called the oscillator, will oscillate electrons back and forth through the aerial. And this jiggling back and forth will produce radio waves. What will happen is that the electrons will vibrate back and forth and they'll create a changing electric field. And that changing electric field will create a changing magnetic field. The changing magnetic field will create another changing electric field. And so we'll get this pattern set up of electric fields and magnetic fields and the whole set of fields will sort of propagate through empty space or in this case through the air. This is of course what an electromagnetic wave is. So by changing the frequency of the oscillating circuit we can change the frequency of the wave that it produces. Now we receive them in a pretty similar way. Once again we need an aerial and a circuit. When the electromagnetic waves reach the receiving aerial, they cause the electrons in that aerial to start moving back and forth with the same frequency as the sending signal. So we have a, a source of electromagnetic waves that has electrons moving back and forth and creating a wave of that frequency. And when the wave of that frequency hits the receiving aerial, the electrons inside it start to oscillate at the same frequency. The electrons that vibrate will be vibrating at the same rate as the electrons in the source. Now if we have vibrating electrons, that of course means that there must be current flowing. So in fact, we get an electrical signal in the circuit connected to the receiving aerial that is exactly the same as the electrical circuit in the source of electromagnetic waves. So if we wanted to transmit a number, for example, kilohertz, which is what the frequency of radio waves is measured in, then we can start causing our oscillator to vibrate at, say, 400 hertz, and our receiving antenna will have its circuit start to vibrate at 400 hertz. So it's possible to transmit information. In fact, as we'll see a bit later, we can use this to transmit sound, for example, over the radio. As it turns out, we can also use it to transmit pictures, and that's television. Now, shortwave radio waves can actually be bounced off the atmosphere, and this is very, very useful for communication. It turns out we can send a signal to another spot on Earth, even if we can't see that other signal. If we want to transmit visible light from place to place, then we need to have a line of sight to the place that we want to send it to. We need to be able to see them, in short. For this sort of radio wave, that's not the case. If we send an AM radio signal, then we can just send it straight up to the sky and it will bounce off the sky, so to speak, the ionosphere, and back down to the ground. And this means that it's possible to transmit this sort of radio waves without being able to see the receiver. We can even sort of curve these messages around the curvature of the Earth, so the Earth doesn't get in the way of these radio signals. Once we get up to high energy radio waves, we start getting to low energy microwaves, which, as I'm sure you know, are popular for use in cooking, in microwave ovens like these. The reason for this is because they can use a process called dielectric heating to heat up water. They do this thing with the water molecules that makes them very, very hot. And it is in fact the water molecules that will heat up the rest of the food. This is why if you have a piece of food with a fairly dry outer layer but a moist inner layer, it'll seem to heat up from the inside out. And so, of course, microwave ovens, as we know, are very useful today. And they operate just by using microwaves, which are produced in a similar way to radio waves, causing electrons in an antenna to vibrate back and forth very quickly. Except in this case, the receiving antenna is not a conductor made of metal, but water molecules. We can also use microwaves for communication, not just for cooking. The thing is, they can't be bounced off the ionosphere, like AM radio, so we have to have line of sight to where we're transmitting to. And so for this reason, we have relay stations, which might look something like this picture over here. These are separated by about 50 kilometers, and they can be used to receive a microwave signal and then increase its power and send it to the next relay station until the signal reaches where it needs to go. Of course, if something gets in the way between two different relay stations, we might not be able to transmit the microwaves quite as reliably. Now, it turns out that both radio waves and microwaves can be used to detect distant objects. Radio detection and ranging, also known as radar, is a way of using microwaves or radio waves to detect objects. Just like sound waves, if a microwave or a radio wave collides with an object or goes into a different medium, then part of it will be transmitted through and part of it will bounce back. And of course, if we measure the time that it takes for the light to get all the way to the object and then all the way back, 
we can figure out how far away it is, just like using sound waves for sonar. So in this way, it's possible to figure out the location of very distant objects, like planes, or if we're weathermen, clouds. So speed cameras are another use of radar that measure the speed of moving objects, like a car. Now getting to higher energies, we have infrared light. Now infrared light have longer wavelengths than visible light, which is why we can't see them, but shorter wavelengths than microwaves. So the sort of visible light that is closest to infrared light is red. That's why, of course, it's called infrared. Now it turns out that we can detect infrared light, but not with our eyes. We feel infrared radiation as heat on, for example, our skin. And so we can measure it with thermometers, for example, or thermistors. It turns out that hot objects will glow with infrared light. So you know, of course, that if you heat up an object hot enough, it'll start glowing red hot, which means it's really, really hot. But if you heat it further, it'll become yellow hot, which is even hotter. And we can see there that we're progressing from red to orange to yellow, and then we sort of get all of them, so it becomes sort of white hot. But you can see that we're progressing up the electromagnetic spectrum. It turns out that if we're not hot enough to be red hot, then we'll be infrared hot. So a saucepan on a stove, for example, might not be glowing red hot, but if we could see an infrared, we would notice that it was glowing infrared hot. This phenomenon is called black body radiation. So it turns out that as well as using thermometers or thermistors or our sense of touch, we're able to detect infrared light by using photographic film, which is of course how we get pictures like this taken. So what else is it good for? Well, we can use it for remote controls, for TVs or garage doors or things like that. We can also use it for short range wireless transmission. If we get to fairly long wavelength infrared, we can use it for Bluetooth, for example, which is a way of transmitting information wirelessly. The other thing that we can use it for is night vision. If we have a source of infrared light, so an infrared torch, and we have a camera that can detect the infrared light, then it's possible to see in the dark, as it were, by shining a bright infrared light and then using a camera to turn that infrared light into a visible picture that we can see. And so using this, it's possible to navigate around in the dark as if you could see with visible light without making yourself visible to anyone who might be watching. Going up a bit higher, we have visible light. The closest sort of visible light to infrared light is red. And as we get to higher and higher energies, we go through yellow, green, blue, and eventually get to violet. So we're pretty familiar with it, right? The colors of the rainbow, colors that we can see, pretty straightforward. Now this sort of light is emitted by TV screens, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it. It's emitted by light bulbs, because they're glowing white hot, and it's emitted by the sun, which is why it's visible. We can detect it with photographic film in a camera like this one, or perhaps a camera that's a bit more modern. And we can of course also detect it with our eyes, which are great little organic detectors of electromagnetic waves. So after we get from red all the way up to violet, and we get to higher energy electromagnetic waves, we're no longer in the visible spectrum, and we're past violet, so we're in the ultraviolet light part of the spectrum. Now ultraviolet light is quite helpful for us, because if it lands in our skin, then it will help produce vitamin D, which is an important part of how the body works. Without vitamin D, we can get quite sick. UV light has more energy than visible light. And that means that if we're exposed to it for too long, at the beach for example, then it can cause burns or skin cancer. And that of course is why it's easier to get sunburned outside than it is to get sunburned inside. It turns out that using something like sunscreen makes you completely opaque to ultraviolet light. If ultraviolet light tries to shine through sunscreen, it gets absorbed by the sunscreen without passing through. So sunscreen is able to block quite effectively ultraviolet light. As we can see from this picture, ultraviolet light can have another effect. It can cause some materials to fluoresce, which is the fancy name for glow. There are some materials that if we shine ultraviolet light on them, they will start emitting visible light. And so if we get a black light, for example, which is a way of emitting lots of ultraviolet light, then we can cause certain sorts of paints to glow. If we get to higher energy than ultraviolet light, then we get to X-rays and gamma rays, which are the highest energy electromagnetic waves that exist. Remember that beyond a certain threshold, all electromagnetic waves count as gamma rays. So gamma rays are the highest type of electromagnetic wave. What we have here though, is an image taken with X-rays. So X-rays are produced by accelerating electrons to high speeds inside a cathode ray tube or an X-ray tube, and then causing them to change their energy very quickly, which will release a lot of X-ray radiation. And we can detect them by photographic film, just like infrared, visible or ultraviolet light. And because they have so much energy, they can in fact pass through soft objects like flesh or blood. And so this means that we can use them to take photographs or x-ray graphs, I suppose, of bones. 
We can see from this picture over here that the x-rays pass straight through the flesh on the hands, but they get blocked by the bones. So the bones appear opaque, the x-rays can't pass through them, whereas the flesh is much more transparent to x-rays. We can see too that for the computer that this fellow is typing on, the plastic is completely transparent to x-rays, but the metal circuitry inside is not. It blocks the x-rays and so it appears dark in this picture. Well, once we get higher energy than x-rays, there's only one kind of electromagnetic wave left. And that, of course, is gamma rays. So there are no types of electromagnetic wave that have more energy than gamma rays. We just have higher and higher energies of gamma rays. These are, of course, produced in nuclear reactions. If we're nuclear physicists, then we'll call the process of releasing these gamma rays gamma radiation. There are a few other types of nuclear radiation, those being alpha radiation and beta radiation, but they don't have much to do with electromagnetic waves. We can detect gamma rays both with photographic film, the same way as we would do for x-rays, or we can use Geiger counters, which are special meters that can measure the amount of radiation in the local environment. Geiger counters, of course, can also be used to measure the other sorts of radiation, alpha radiation and beta radiation. So this is the end of the theory. We'll learn a bit about how to detect all the different sorts of electromagnetic waves in the spectrum. Let's go on to some questions. Question 11. Which wave is the odd one out? Is it the microwaves, the x-rays, the infrared light, or the radio waves? So odd one out, what could this possibly mean? Well, it means that one of these electromagnetic waves has properties that are quite different to the rest of them. Three of them are quite similar in terms of the amount of energy they carry and what they are used for, whereas the last one is quite different. And of course, our answer is going to be x-rays, B. The reason for this is because they have much, much higher energy than any of the others, infrared light, microwaves, or radio waves, and because they are used for a different purpose. Radio waves, microwaves, and infrared light are used for communication, whether it's communication between machines, as in infrared light, or communication between people, as in radio waves and microwaves. X-rays, on the other hand, far too energetic and far too readily absorbed by air to be able to use for communication. So this means that X-rays are quite different to the other sorts. Of course, they are all electromagnetic waves, so they're all produced by changing electric and magnetic fields. But in terms of what we use them for and how much energy they carry, X-rays are definitely different to the others. Question 12. Name a use for each of the following electromagnetic waves, starting with radio waves. What can we use these for? The radio in their title sort of gives it away. We can use them for communication. When we listen to a radio, we're listening to the sound decoded from radio waves that have been transmitted to that radio. B. Infrared light. What's this used for? One useful use of infrared light is, for example, a remote control, which will send out pulses of infrared light to a receiver, and the receiver will, once receiving those pulses, decode them and do something useful. Ultraviolet light, what is this good for? Well, we know that it can be harmful, right? It causes sunburn or skin cancer, but what can we use it for good? One use for it might be to make something glow or fluoresce, or we could use it to kill germs and sterilize, for example, food that we intend to put at the supermarket. Finally, what about x-rays? X-rays, as we all know, are useful in medical purposes. We can use x-rays for imaging bones. X-ray imagery is a way of looking through the soft tissue in order to see the hard tissue beneath it. Question 13. Certain wavelengths of radio wave will bounce off the upper, upper atmosphere of the Earth. Why is this helpful for communication? The answer, of course, is because it lets us get around the pesky curvature of the Earth which normally means that the Earth is able to block any transmissions from going over the horizon. So it's possible to bounce shortwave radio around the Earth by firing it up at the sky and then effectively bouncing it off the sky and back down to the ground. So this means that we're able to send a signal around the world without it having to go through the Earth, which would, of course, block it and prevent it from going through. So this means that we're able to send shortwave radio over the horizon to very distant receivers indeed. Question 14. Name at least three ways by which electromagnetic waves may be detected. So we've just had a whole section on detecting these waves. We should be able to name at least three. And in fact, I can name four for you. The first one is by antennae. Radios, whether it's a handheld radio or a car or something like that, use metal antennae in order to detect radio waves coming in. The radio waves cause the electrons in the antennae to vibrate. Those vibrations set up an oscillation in an electrical circuit and that oscillation can then be turned into sound waves. What's a different sort of detection method? Well, you might be thinking of photographic film. We can use photographic film in order to detect infrared light, visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays, and gamma rays. 
In short, anything with at least as much energy as infrared light can be detected with specially treated photographic film. Let's get on to the more exotic forms of detection, shall we? First one that's a bit closer to home, but only works for a very narrow band of wavelengths, and that is, of course, the eye. Visible light can be detected by the eye, but none of these other sorts can. So it's very useful for detecting waves, but it only detects a very small number of them, or a very small range of frequencies. Our last one will also detect a rather small range of frequencies, but only for very, very high energy waves. Gamma rays. Can you remember what that one is? It's the Geiger counter, which can be used for measuring nuclear radiation, whether that's alpha radiation, beta radiation, or gamma radiation. Question 15. When filming nocturnal wildlife, for example in a nature documentary, visible light can't be used for illumination because it bothers all the nocturnal animals. They think it's nighttime. They want it to be nice and dark. But if it's nice and dark, then we can't see them, so we can't film them. How do we solve this problem? Well, the answer is we use a different sort of electromagnetic wave so that we can see in the dark. But what sort of electromagnetic wave should we use? Now, if we use gamma rays or X-rays, then aside from being extremely dangerous, we won't really be able to see the subject of the film very well. Because, of course, to X-rays and gamma rays, flesh and blood is transparent. Only the bones reflect. So we wouldn't be seeing little nocturnal animals running around. We'd be seeing their skeletons, which, as you can imagine, would probably not be very popular in a nature documentary. So what we want to use is something that's very close to visible wavelengths, but which cannot be seen. We could use ultraviolet light, but we don't want to sunburn the poor little critters. So instead, we'll use infrared light. We can use infrared light in order to illuminate the scene that we want to film. Now this won't disturb the wildlife because it's not visible light. Some insects and so on are able to see ultraviolet light, but if we use infrared light, then we won't be bothering them either. Then we can use a camera that is sensitive to infrared light in order to film the scene. Of course, ordinarily, cameras will film in three colors, red, green, blue, and then uh, give us an image in a visible spectrum, which will be a whole different range of frequencies of light. If we're only filming a single wavelength of infrared light, then we're effectively filming in black and white, but it's better than nothing, I'm sure you'll agree. We're at the end of the questions now, which means that we've finished the lesson. So in this section, we've learned about all the different types of electromagnetic waves and how they are detected, whether it's by photographic film, by the eye, by a Geiger counter, or by antennae.